Production of this program was sponsored in part by Suter's Handcrafted Furniture of Harrisonburg. Since 1839, Suter's has created elegant furniture your family will value for generations. Additional funding was provided by the law firm of Wharton, Aldheiser, and Weaver of Harrisonburg, providing a full range of legal services to its business and individual clients throughout the Shenandoah Valley since 1845. Harrisonburg, Virginia, the friendly city. A strong old valley town thriving with business and industry. In recent years, this agricultural community has become a melting pot of entrepreneurs, artists, and students from all over the world. As the backgrounds of the residents of a community become more diverse, the past identity of that community is often forgotten. But those native to Harrisonburg remember its past vividly and have seen many changes over the years. Join them now as they resurrect the Harrisonburg that they remember and hold as dear as a member of the family in Harrisonburg then and now. Well, Harrisonburg has always been a thoroughfare, you know, for travelers. Mm -hmm. And in 1905 and the early part of the century, South Main Street was a dirt road. Two-way traffic, a dirt road, farm animals, wagons, horseback riders, you know, it's hard to believe. And it was farmland around there. Mm -hmm. You look at the old pictures of the Joshua Wilton House, for example, mm -hmm. and their backyard was a farm. In the early part of the century, Harrisonburg was still a small town, but not for long. By 1910, two of Harrisonburg's largest institutions had been established, the college that would become James Madison and Rockingham Memorial Hospital. William uh, Gladwell Leak was the instrumental person in starting the hospital here, and it happened because of a tragedy in his own family. Let me read you about his background. He left about $40,000 to build one, and that was a lot of money in 1912. While at work in his stable, a horse stepped on his foot. Blood poisoning developed. Amputation may have saved his life, but he wouldn't consent to this. It was said that had there been a hospital here, his life would have been prolonged. In his will, after providing for his sister, he left his entire life savings to bequeathing the founding of Rockingham Memorial Hospital. He died on October 20th, 1908, and Rockingham Memorial opened four years later. Um, 1908 was really a very eventful year. That was also the year that uh, the first Model T came out, and it was the year that the General Assembly passed put, uh, placing the State Teachers College in Harrisonburg. There was no college for women west of the Blue Ridge, and there was a lot of concern about whether or not girls for example, from Norfolk, which is near sea level, mm -hmm. could survive in the elevation <laughs> here. <laughs> I mean, it was really funny. Harrisonburg was called Rock Town for many, many years. And then the west boundary is today's High Street. Mm -hmm. And High Street for many years was called West Street. Uh, Main Street for many years was called Irish Street. And I've already mentioned that um, Liberty Street was called German Street. That changed in 1916 as the war clouds were getting darker and darker in the, the Great War, which later on was renamed World War I. Mary Spitzer Etter was living in Harrisonburg when the Great War came to an end. Her parents moved to the city in 1911, and Mary was born in this house on West Market Street in 1912. Her father, was a Harrisonburg businessman. I remember that my father had the bookstore on Main Street, and uh, of course when we got, were small, and we, we didn't have a car or anything, and there were, weren't many cars then, and we would, mother would take us down to his store. And it was located across from Nation's Bank down on Main Street, where it was in that section where they cleaned it all out and made a parking lot mm -hmm. recently. Right next to his store was a little cigar store, 
and because they had the old cigar store Indian statue that stood right outside it there. It was right next to my daddy's stove. Well, I went to Waterman School up here, and uh, this was all open fields, and there were no, no buildings down here below us. None of these uh, houses on Willow Street. It wasn't a street. It was just open fields. I can remember how we had a wire fence along there, and then the old, it was an old silk mill then, but it's a plastic factory now. And uh, we went around that and on out, and Waterman School, was uh, had just the first unit with eight rooms, four downstairs and four up. And Miss Ethel Spillman was our principal. And Miss Ethel kept on for many years. And when I did student teaching from Harrisonburg Teachers College, she was my supervisor and I was in her room. Yeah. You know, the only person I can really remember at Waterman School was one of the teacher I had was Mrs. Gwynn. Miss mm -hmm. Gwynn. Oh. You remember her? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. I spent I a lot of hours in a hall in mm -hmm. her class. <laughs> Waterman had some real good teachers. Miss Malk was an excellent teacher. Mm -hmm. Everybody really liked her. You know, I can't remember her principal. <laughs> the principal was Betty Jones. And then uh, when she retired, she was a real old lady. And uh, then uh, Mr. Tankard came. I remember Tankard. He came from the state penitentiary. He was a guard or whatever <laughs> down there. And one of the sixth graders got him down in the boys' restroom and beat him up. <laughs> it's Bobby Smith. Miss Mitchell was my first grade teacher. The meanest woman that ever got behind him. That's it. true. <laughs> I don't think she stayed but the one year. I think I they, they dismissed her. She was very, very rough. Well, the recess, we made too much noise during a play period that we weren't supposed to be outside, but she let us go out. And then when she brought us back in, she made us all put our heads on the desk and lay our fingers out, and then she cracked us with one of those triangle rulers across the knuckles. And then every kid in the class sat there and cried, and she got upset about that. So. <laughs> she was right rough. I, I remember uh, some go with her over lunch one one day. I had, apparently, mother had unknowingly given me a Canadian dime and it didn't set well with her but it was in my lunch money and she made a spectacle of herself over that. We wouldn't have known the difference. Blankety blank <laughs> Hannah, wouldn't you like to, wouldn't you like to go back to first grade now being the person that you are today and, and no. replay no. that scene no. about her giving you trouble over a dime? I'd like to do that. I'd like to crack her knuckles. <laughs> yeah. Well, there you go. See, that's what I mean. One of those. Yeah, I can do that. I do recall in 1947, I think it was, they formed the uh, patrol boys at Waterman School, which is, I guess nowadays you'd call them crossing guards. But the teachers selected who was to be the patrol boys, and they were uh, issued uniforms. We had regular police uniforms with the badges, the hats, the whole works, and Tucky Leak, a city policeman, spearheaded that um, program. And it was quite an honor at that time to be a patrol boy. That, uh, and your job was to be out on the playground. If anybody was misbehaving or being a bully, then you were supposed to sort of act as a junior policeman, I guess, report it or try to do something about it. I remember real well a Miss Fanny Speck. She was a third grade teacher. She was an old lady and she was very strict, but she was a good teacher and everybody really liked her. I think it was the third or the fourth grade. The old school had gotten so crowded that they had to build these buildings and they just built one-room buildings, and uh, it was a temporary arrangement. And uh, they were, I don't know how many there were, but there were several, half a dozen or more, I guess. Yeah. And everybody in town called them the chicken coop. Yeah, that was the name that we, we gave them when, they, when we had to go up there. <laughs> well, I attended Effinger Street School, and uh, the school that uh, I attended was located uh, just about on the parking lot of the automotive store beside Rose's store. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course it was an 11th grade uh, school. Mm -hmm. Elementary was downstairs and the uh, high school had the second floor. I graduated from Evanger. Last class to graduate from Evanger and the first class to graduate from Sims. The school wasn't completed, but they had the uh, graduating 
exercises there at the auditorium. Of course, Miss uh, Lucia Sims was uh, our first grade teacher. And uh, at that time, I don't recall exactly when Miss Lucy uh, passed away, but she did pass away before uh, the Effinger School was closed. She uh, donated the land that the school was built on. I'm told that uh, she was born during slavery and that that was one of the plantations up there. It was all farmland up in there at that time. And so uh, she gave the land to the city schools uh, board. And that was how it happened to be built and named Lucy F. Sims School. Mary Fairfax remembers her days at Lucy Sims School from a different perspective. She was a teacher. After getting her degree from Virginia State, she taught at several schools in Virginia before returning home to Harrisonburg. From then on, I stayed at Sims School. And I worked, I did the music for Sims School. And of course, later on, we had supervisors, but um, the last one that was such a nice and Mrs. Mrs. Um, um, name starts with an H. She worked at the high school until she retired. It was not Hackett, it was Hackman. Nancy Hackman. Oh, she was a lovely person. We worked together so much in music because we had the high school music course and everything. And um, so I stayed at Sims until it closed, 1966. And Mr. Harris was the principal. At Lucy Sims, if I'm not mistaken, I think almost 40 some years. Almost 40 some years. And we retired. Mm -hmm. So he was the principal there for a long, long time. And um, we had um, the school was, was a consolidated school at the time. And I might want to say that kids came here to go to school from Mount Jackson, New Market, uh, uh, Broadway, any kids that lived in the county areas like Bridgewater. Elton Shanador. That's as far away as kids came here to go to school. And I remember one time, I'll tell you a story about Mr. Harris. We used to have the old theaters downtown. There used to be one called the State Theater. I don't know if you ever heard of it or not. They had the Virginia Theater. And uh, we, were, we were near school. We were, we were uh, juniors that year. And we decided we were going to skip school and go to the movies. So we did, and we went to the movie. Well, we had one family, I don't know if you, Red Bundy's wife's mother. Okay. The two younger boys were involved. So somebody said that Miss Julia was on her way to the movie because the principal had let all the families know that we had skipped school. <laughs> so the next day, Mr. Harris called me in the office, and he said, young lady? And I said, yes, sir. He said, now you know you're over here going to school, and your mother and father are working to, for you to go to school. Now, do you want me to call your mother and father up and tell them that you skipped school? And I said, no, sir. <laughs> well, let's don't let this happen anymore. Mm -hmm. But see, and you listen, and that's all you had to say. That's all. I, I look back on some of the teachers that I had here and at home, and, and those people were very special in my life, and, and we never forgot them. I have discovered that Harrisburg High started football in 1921. Now that's when the high school was downtown in what we now call the municipal building. So all that paved parking lot between the Delhi News Record and the back of the municipal building, that was the ball field. And uh, someone told me just recently that at the end zone toward Court Square or north, uh, there was literally a building, a brick building, right at the end of the end zone. So the point was, if you ran too rapidly into the end zone with a touchdown score, you know, you better beware, you run right smack into that brick wall. Uh, the original part of today's Harrisburg High was built in 1928, and uh, there the school sat up on the hill on the edge of town. But uh, in fall, uh, the fun thing to do, uh, and we never missed them, believe me, would go to the Friday night football games of Harrisburg High, which was, by the way, in the early 50s, the field itself would be laid out with that white uh, lime stuff as soon as the Turk season was over, in the outfield. 
okay? <laughs> and then they would quickly put together these green wooden grand, uh, bleachers on the other side as far away as possible from the Mo Memorial Stadium dirt area. Uh, so that's where the home crowd sat. And then they'd have a few bleachers left over to sit in the dirt, get this, of about second base area, where our visitors would have to sit. But a lot of people could not fit into the meager little bleachers that were set up. So it was very typical to see, uh, especially the older men of the community, lined up along the ropes, you know, on each side of the field. And then they'd follow the ball. So if Harrisonburg had the ball down on the 20 yard line and was marching in that direction, these men would kind of migrate down the field as the streaks made progress toward the opponent's goal line. But oh, it was so much fun. And I frankly grew up with the impression because it didn't take all that many people to fill the bleachers that everybody in town was here. And the cheerleaders would tie colored streamers to the goal posts. Okay, blue in one end, and if it was Lexington, red at the other end. And then the game would end up, and people would get in their cars, and if we had won the game, you'd toot your horn, ring your cowbells, drive downtown, and go around that square, and around that square, and shout at anybody who happened to be on the street the results. Madison College um, was a state teacher's college. It was a woman's college. And I remember uh, us boys were not allowed to date the college students, the, the ladies, unless we were on an approved list. You had to be, you had to more or less make application and they wanted to check you out before you were allowed to date them. Well, now dating was something else. I didn't have any experience with that until I was a junior. I met my husband and started dating. We were allowed to have one date a week and on Sunday. Uh, on the weekday, we had to meet our dates in Alumni Hall, in the reception room at Alumni Hall, and uh, leave them there. We had to sign up. We had to get permission from home to date the person that we were going with. The dean of women had to have a written permission. We could not get in a car except on Sunday afternoon. We could go driving on Sunday afternoon, but we couldn't go wait in a car on the night dates. So if we were going to the movie, we had to walk all the way downtown and walk all the way back. I, I wore shoes out like nobody's business. <laughs> Many a day, I made, went downtown three times. Like I went down to the elementary school to um, observe for education classes. I went in the afternoon to shop. I went back that night to a movie. Three times, and each time it's a mile. It's a mile from the campus to downtown. Yeah. Or so they said then. But I was there the year that Wilson Hall was dedicated. Yeah. I went there in 30 and they were building it. And May the 15th of 1931 was the day that it was uh, dedicated. And that was one big day. Because the student body had to march in in a body. We had to wear white. We had two or three songs that we had to learn by heart. Yeah, this entire student body. And um, we had the governor and all, the, all of these um, special people, you know, there. Uh, mother and sister and I went to the dedication that morning. And uh, Mrs. Woodrow, it was named Wilson Hall, Woodrow Wilson Hall. And Mrs. Wilson was living then, the pres ex-president's wife was living in Stanton, and she was the honor guest. And I could see her yet, and in my annual, I have the picture of the crowd that was there. And she, I know she wore a hat on her head. And when they introduced her, she just stood and bowed. She never did say anything. She probably was not a speaker. Yeah. She didn't say anything, but she was there. The Glee Club sang. Now, I wasn't in the Glee Club till I was a sophomore, but I remember that they all uh, sang for it. Yes, indeed, they were there. Yeah. And uh, they had the organ then. And I'm sure that uh, Miss Schaefer uh, directed uh, the songs. Mm -hmm. You know, they had hymn books in the uh, in the shelf uh, in each seat. You know, and then when we'd have chapel services, you know, three times a week, where we could sing hymns. Oh. And uh, of course, I guess they took all those out and burned them after they couldn't <laughs> sing hymns and have chapel anymore. You know, yeah. for us girls to go downtown, we could go down to the 
uh, elementary school to observe without doing this, but to go downtown, we had to wear hats and gloves. And of course, pants were unknown then. I mean, nobody wore jeans or, or slacks, you know, we wore skirts. But we had to wear hats and gloves if we were going downtown to the movies or to shop. There was one store on that, in that same block on the right called Candyland. I'm not sure, one of the Juliuses run, landed, I believe, and uh, they had the most delicious candy, but they had these little um, tables that you could get, you know, uh, Sunday or whatever you wanted, and that was the epitome of, of something nice. You went to the movies and you have, well, this was during the Depression. We didn't have much more than the fare to the movies, but if we had a little bit over and could stop in Candyland for Sunday or something like that, a shake or something, you know, that was great. Well, we'd go to cowboy movies downtown. We had three theaters. Uh, Virginia Theater was the Cadillac of the theaters back then. It had a stage with the uh, velvet curtains and the um, organ and a, a ramp, which a sloped floor. That was the, the best theater. Uh, the most economical and the one that showed the best movies was the Strand Theater, which was across from the uh, A&N store, across from the State Theater. And I think you could get in for a double feature for a quarter. <laughs> and I think most of us kids took that and then took what was left over and went to Hershey's. That was a, a sort of a sandwich shop up on Newman Avenue where you could buy chocolate soda and sandwich or whatever for a little bit or nothing. That was the place where a lot of the kids hung out. Uh. Strand Theater showed mostly Western movies on Saturday. And then the Virginia Theater had a nice balcony to it. And a beautiful balcony to the Virginia Theater, which is uh, <clears throat> well, the parking lot there uh, at Water Street now in uh, Maine. But um, I remember uh, sitting in the balcony of that theater and watching Gone with the Wind when I was just quite young. As youngsters, we would go there sort of automatic on Saturday afternoons. It only cost 20 cents to get in. And mom and, and dad would give us a quarter. So we had a nickel left for a box of candy out of the machine that you'd buy in the lobby, of course, on your way in. We'd stay all afternoon, see the, um, the main feature, which was usually a Western, plus the comics, the previews, and the serial. Now the serial was very important because they would run like 12 or 14 weeks, you know, chapter by chapter. So you get hooked on a serial, you'd have to go every week to make sure you didn't miss anything. Oh, they were exciting. I loved it. The Crimson Ghost was my favorite one. I had a crush on uh, Sandra I. And we all wrote our notes, but the first date I had, the first date that I remember going anywhere was with her. I took her to the movies and she left with Urban Crab. <laughs> <laughs> no luck at all. She did, she had a crush on She played us off of him, making him jealous. <laughs> so they got together in the movie theater, talked, and they left together. <laughs> yeah, so I was sitting there with a bag of empty popcorn. I remember going down to the theater on Saturday afternoon when I was a kid. I got 50 cents for my allowance. And my friends and I could, could, could walk downtown, which, by the way, I wouldn't allow my grandchildren to do these days, but, <laughs> but we could walk from our home downtown, and we would go in Georgia's Soda and Sandwich Shop, which was, on, was somewhere on, was on Main Street. I remember it was a long counter. It was a narrow, just a counter. It's about where Jess's was, is now, uh, and it's yeah, the bargain place. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you, anyway, we would go in there, and at that time, you could take food into the theater, which we can't do anymore either. We have to pay $10 for popcorn and a drink now, but, <laughs> but I could take my 50 cents, this is my point, I could take my 50 cents, and we could get a hot dog and an order of french fries and a soda, and they'd put it in a bag for us, and we could take it to the theater. That was 10 cents a piece. That was 30 cents of my 50 cents. And the ticket, if I recall correctly, at the movie was 20 cents. It was exactly what I got for allowance, that I could take a hot dog, a soda, and french fries and go to the movie on Saturday <laughs> afternoons. And I just remember doing that when we were kids. Of course, we had to sit up in the balcony in those days, you know. They had signs there to color it, where the color had to go. And so we'd, we had good seats. 
Yeah, yeah, we had good seats, but it, it was in a—I mean, segregated, you yeah. know. And then uh, just like when we uh, go to film stations, place like that, to, you can get gas there. But they had a white restroom, colored restroom, mm -hmm. back in those days. Mm -hmm. And you had to sit on the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. Well, th this town was a whole lot different. This, this was a friendly town here. Yeah. yeah. Friendly town, white and blacks got along fine. You know, it's interesting when you hear people talk about um, integrating because, believe it or not, whites and blacks lived next door to each other even then. Really? Yeah, down on Rock Street, where the Tolliver family lived. All their neighbors on both sides on the lower end were white families. They knew each other just like, like all the time. We used to have the old Black Baptist Church used to be on the corner of Wolf and Mason Street. And let's see what's on the corner now. Uh, the Shul, old Shul store that just moved from down there. Right in that corner lot there, that's where the old black Baptist church was, on that corner. And then the rest of it was residential. And across from there was, we used to have a USO here. I don't know if Yellen told you about that or not. We, they had a USO place here. And you could, you know, that's where the, when, when, when the soldiers came back home or whatever, they, you know, they always had activities there. Uh, then on the corner was another restaurant, and there was a dance hall over top of it, and it used to be called the Colonnade. The Robinsons ran the restaurant downstairs, and the dance hall was upstairs, and that's where they used to have all the big dances a years ago. Now, that's the place where they had big band dances years ago that my parents used to come over here and go to the dances. One of the biggest bands in Harrisonburg was Harry Lee Solomon and the Aces of Rhythm. Weldon Bundy played trumpet for the band. He was a busy musician playing for the dance band at night, and playing for a marching band by day. 1944, he and his father started a group of Harrisonburg's most well-known marching musicians. Wendy's band. See, my daddy, he, he played. And then I, my brother, he, I had an older brother, he passed. He started playing the trumpet, and uh, he quit. And then I took it up. And I, uh, I was about 10 or 11, by the age of 14, I was playing in dance band. And see, by me having experience playing in dance bands, my dad was teaching like marches and you know music like that, and uh, I decided we were gonna start playing a little jazz because I had the, the ability to to teach them. So we started playing popular music. That's when everything took a hold. Oh, we, it was different from playing marches and stuff like that. You know, you play good hot music, all that jazz. <laughs> Yeah, that's when everybody wanted us. We started playing everywhere. We started, I think, really about 1944, but we didn't come out to about 45. We used to march around the blocks here and kids would uh, follow us, you know. We have about seven, maybe eight, and then uh, somebody else, the uh, community, they would, they had instruments in the closet or something, they would give to donate it to the band, you know. And then the ones that wasn't able to buy, uh, my daddy used to, Miles Music Company was here. And uh, my daddy went down there and propositioned Mr. Miles. If the kid wanted to buy a horn, he'd pay, he'd pay a dollar a week. On oh, Mr. Miles let us have it. The boy, the parents had to pay a dollar a week. <laughs> till you pay for the horn. In the 40s, Red Bundy and the band had Harrisonburg's joints jumping. And several years later, Harrisonburg teenagers were twisting the night away on WSVA's Dr. Pepper Show. They would take time out during the show and they would call people at home and for every Dr. Pepper you had up to 12 in your refrigerator, they'd give you a silver dollar. And that's where it got his name, Dr. Pepper Silver Dollar Show. And a local kid would go out there and dance on the show. 
They hit somebody. They, they knew where they, they were going, come. where they were making a call, and then the guy would come to your door while they was there, and they would verify. They'd come in and verify how many, and that's how many. No. <laughs> We had uh, the recreation department down uh, East Market Street, up over George's Confectionery, and now George's Restaurant. We used to put 200, 225 kids up there on Friday and Saturday night at teen dances. I don't know how, what would have happened if they were calling for it, because you didn't have way of, wasn't but one way out of there. Well, Breen's Willow Bank was a big uh, teenage hangout. It's uh, on South Main Street now. It's uh, uh, now I think uh, Dunnigan's is the proper name of it, but uh, Mr. Breen run a very tight operation. It was a place that the parents felt comfortable with their kids going to because they knew there wouldn't be any mischief or carrying on. You drive up and they had uh, people who come out and hang trays on the side of your car, wait on you, and he, he put out a mean barbecue. Yeah. Uh, and he had uh, signs I remember hanging up looked like moons, half moons, quarter moons, and so forth, and they would play the music that we associated with at that, that time. It was just a good hangout for the kids to go. They had a sandwich called the Valley Block. The sandwich called the Valley Block was a huge sandwich. It was a double-decker hamburger with double, cheese and yeah. onions. And, yeah. and Breen's, Mrs. Breen was our second grade elementary teacher. And when you went out to Breen's Willow Bank to eat and stuff, they pretty much kept a good hand on you. You didn't raise really ruckus in there. There was a place that was on South Main Street. Um, I think Yee's place is located on that spot now, but it was a place called Biff Burgers. And you could go in there and get great fries and uh, hamburgers. And I remember eating there quite a lot. And, and then where Kinko's is there just at the university was uh, the dairy route. Dairy right. And that was really great because you could drive in and push the button and order from your car and they'd bring your food out, you know, and so that was always exciting. Well, the first peoples I remember was in there where Valley Finance is now. And we go down there and get cherry cokes and chocolate cokes. And then it moved up to the Hallmark store next to the Virginia Theater. And one of the favorite things in the summertime was to get a half a cantaloupe with ice cream in the center of it. <laughs> there was a gentleman named Mr. Um, Lenzel Mosby who had a soda shop on Wolf Street where the young people could go in and listen to music and, you know, drink sodas. Spitzer's Grocery Store on the corner of Federal and uh, Gay Street. Uh, also across from that was a black-operated uh, business, a restaurant by Charlie, Charlie Strother. Uh, on the corner of, uh, of Gay and Main was Jackson's Restaurant. And um, the, the blacks would be served in the rear of the restaurant and whites in the Main Street part. Okay. But occasionally you'd see either one coming in either door. Yeah. There, was no, there was no problem there. My favorite restaurant in Harrisonburg when I was growing up, I think, was Joyce's Restaurant. And they had moved. Where people, where we talked, we had talked about the peoples. They were in peoples, and Frittles was right up the street where Jess's is. But they moved down across from the Catholic Church, I believe, right next to Glen's. Yeah, Caddy Caddy Corner, Corner. Yeah. and right next door to Glen's Fair Price. And they were one of the first, uh, one of the first restaurants to serve pizza. And uh, Mr. Mr. George, oh, oh, George Joyce would come on. The old man would come on. I know, no, George is his middle son. Old man just come along and Gus, yeah. And uh, if you're reading a comic book, which is always good if your mom took you shopping to get a comic book so that you'd be quiet in the restaurant, he'd always come and turn it upside down and say, you read it wrong, you'll read it wrong. Now he didn't read, you know. <laughs> and George come along and you would eat pizza and you look underneath the pizza like this. And, eh, it's, it's too well done. Yeah, I'll give you, give you another one. You finish that one, I'll give you another one. <laughs> so, <laughs> that was Joyce's, I love that. So. Uh, parades were a big thing. Uh, in fact, we got in little trouble with a turkey festival. They would throw turkeys out of the buildings, live turkeys, and people would scramble to catch them, and that, uh, we were told we shouldn't do that. I thought that was cool, I liked that. <laughs> I never did catch a turkey, but I sure went after a couple. I can remember going to uh, Joseph Nays and 
uh, it seems to me you came in on that floor that came in off the street and then uh, it was like a split level or something. You could go up to a, a place where they sold shoes or you could go down into whatever they sold in their basement. But there was a, an elevator that was one of the kind that had the, the kind of folding door, the gate, and, the, and there was a, a little guy I remember in there who would open it up and you know ask you which floor. And I guess they only had two or three floors, but uh, you know what a thing for a city to have uh, an elevator with someone who would uh, operate it. I don't. It, it's hard to look around downtown and and see what is there now and going back and imagine what was there. The old Kavanaugh Hotel, the Warren Hotel, and around the court square. And back then on, on Friday and Saturday nights, you could not literally walk down the sidewalk. You had to walk out in the street because there were so many people. It was interesting to be on duty down as a police officer because everybody came to Harrisonburg to visit that, at that time. I, if they didn't come to shop, they came in. It just seemed like the country people came to Harrisonburg to, to visit. And it was interesting how they would congregate on the streets and, uh, and uh, be together there as friends. I can remember on Saturdays, you couldn't hardly get down through Main Street. On Saturdays, cause all of the county people, the, they would come to town on, uh, on Saturdays. Yeah, do the shopping and loafing around the court square. They had benches there. They, that was the main place where they'd meet and talk, you know. Yeah. By the way, a building that used to be Hersh's stable, mm -hmm. where horses were stored or kept uh, as the Old Order Mennonites would come to town for a Saturday visit of shopping and whatnot, and they'd leave their buggy and horse in the stable right on West Water Street, just a half a block from Court Square. Another thing about downtown Harrisonburg, uh, there were a couple tragedies along the way that I can recall. Probably the first and major one that ever happened that I remember was 1947, middle of the summer, the Great Explosion took place. South Main, right across from the Methodist Church. It was a one-story, uh, almost block-long uh, commercial structure with maybe four or five small shops and there was a gas leak going on and anyway it, it did blew up and uh, I think 10 people died and a lot more were injured and uh, I mean literally uh, we ran from High Street upon hearing this terrible boom uh, straight to the downtown because we saw a huge amount of smoke going up. At that time I was uh, training to be a barber and uh, the shop I was training in was there on uh, Main Street uh, across from where they're building that TV station down here. And I recall that I was going back uh, from lunch and uh, just as I went to step up on the top step of the barber shop, the explosion went off down there. And you could see the debris and dust and everything. It almost knocked you down even up that far. I remember very vividly, I was lived on Colosello Street, and uh, I was 11 years old then. I rode my bicycle down, and it was, it brought the whole town out. I mean, everybody, it was just a terrible thing. And uh, although I don't recall any blast or flash of light or anything, it just, the word spread, and everybody went down that could get down, and um, the rescue effort was tremendous. But I guess there was a, a bright side to it. There was no more killed than what were it at that time because I think it had a jewelry store, a beauty shop, and several other places of business, and they were just completely leveled. I had my hair done in that beauty parlor, and uh, uh, I would have been there that day that the explosion occurred. That was my day to go, but the girl that did my hair had told me whenever I went before, she said, I won't be here that day and I can't take you, and so she assigned me another day, or I might have been in that explosion. And so I felt like the Lord still had work for me to do, but I wasn't in that. And a real good friend of ours was in that, um, Harriet Garber, and she and her mother lived on, up on uh, uh, East Market Street. And uh, 
Her mother had gone to take her nap and Harriet went to have her hair fixed. And she was in there when the explosion occurred. And I'm told that it just cut her head right off. And uh, her mother didn't know that she was in it. Nobody called her. Well, maybe they hadn't gotten everybody identified right at first. And of course, we heard about it. Well, we knew it. I was washing dishes for mother. And then that night, you could still park along Main Street. And I remember we went down and parked along there on Main Street and got out and walked. And if I close my eyes, I can still hear those shovels digging into those rocks and dirt to look for the bodies. The explosion of 1947 made news reports all over the country. And even as far away as Europe, radio broadcasts told of the terrible tragedy in Harrisonburg, Virginia. This was before the age of television, back when radio was king. And in Harrisonburg, everybody listened to WSVA radio. Of course, uh, radio was the big thing then. WSVA was located downtown, uh, right on the court square, the second floor of the um, old Rockingham National Bank building. Yeah. And they would have, um, even back then, what I would call live or remote radio things. So, Radio personalities were very popular. Everybody knew them, and they, they were a big part of our community. Whip and Homer, uh, they were, when I moved to town, that was how you woke up in the morning. And uh, they, um, you know, they would start their chatter about what the weather was like and, um, you know, talk about going out to the barn and if you were milking, what you should be doing and what you should be looking for that day. And they were just wonderful. And of course, they appeared uh, in other places too. They did, you know, variety shows and things like that. Mm -hmm. When I first came to Harrisonburg, I think there were four radio stations in the Shenandoah Valley. Now I think we have four on each block. But anyway, uh, there was one in Waynesboro, one in Stanton, a station in Winchester, and WSVA. Mm -hmm. And of course, being where it is on the dial, uh, you could get WSVA uh, basically from Roanoke to uh, Winchester and of course uh, uh, Eastern West Virginia and uh, also over into uh, the Piedmont area of Virginia. You could actually hear the station uh, in Richmond. So hardly anywhere I went people had heard of me. Yeah. They hadn't seen me much until television came along. I remember when WSVA, it was called WSVA then television, it started in the early 50s, mm -hmm. and it was, of course, uh, we, we would sit around and watch it on television, and all we could see was a test pattern with the idea that, you know, this thing is really going to come. Mm -hmm. Before that, we could watch Richmond, but it was so snowy you couldn't hardly make out what was on the tube. But television came cable-wise, I think I'm right, in the summer of 52, and this private enterprise system to try to sell the product get this, set up a tent up on Old Furnace Road next to the city reservoirs. I'm sure the city allowed them to put it there. And made it known in the, in the daily news record, come watch television, free. And they set up chairs. Well, presidential campaigns were going on that summer, which ultimately resulted in the election of Dwight Eisenhower as president. Well, we got so engrossed in not only television as a newfangled thing, but politics. And we would go up there and watch the Republican convention, then we went up and watched the Democratic convention. I never got so confused in my life. Now, I'm seventh or eighth grade. Eleanor Roosevelt suddenly became my favorite person because she made this fantastic speech on television. Well, anyway, uh, my dad was the first person on our block to sign up. So we had the first television. So every afternoon after that thing got in the living room, the kids came to our house to watch television. And that was howdy duty time. As families became glued to their TV sets, lifestyles in the city began to change. But as Harrisonburg entered the turbulent 60s, the change was only beginning. Both black and white residents of the city say that their society had been somewhat integrated for years. The animosity that plagued many cities in the 60s did not seem to exist here in the friendly city. However, around the time that integration was enforced, 
Harrisonburg city leaders had begun a redevelopment project that had a profound impact on the black community. Eventually, many black business and residential areas would completely disappear. Many people didn't have anywhere to go. And of course, by the time they were acquiring properties, uh, they were beginning to build the public housing. And uh, some people wanted their own homes. And uh, no sites were provi provided for uh, you know, us to build or anything like that. So a lot of them had to go into public housing until they could make other arrangements. And uh, that was a pretty large area, which of course completely changed our lifestyle up in here. There were lots and lots of people who really didn't want to give up their residence um, to relocate or to move. And, and, the, and the, the main thing was, you know, they ended up building all the ho public housing and people kind of resented to being in a cluster together, you know. And a lot of people went a, went a long ways in order to keep from giving up their, their uh, residence because Back in those days, Tracy, a lot of people owned their own homes. The biggest portion of them owned their own homes. I remember one family had just built their home. That was a Tolliver family. And uh, it had to be torn down. And all those houses, and one man never did get right, Mr. Albert Francis. He looked at made him sick, an old man. And he had his home down there on Mason Street. And he just never got over it. He moved and had another home and all, but it was never home to him. And Henry Vickers, who used to work at Cavanaugh Hotel, he never got used to his home on Broad Street because he lived on Wolf Street. They took those houses too. They took our church, our old First Baptist Church. But we got enough money from that to build a new church on Broad Street. The black community was just one area of the city that saw a great change in the 60s and early 70s. Downtown Harrisonburg was another. The place that once was the heartbeat of the city, the focal point for community gatherings and a prime spot for socializing, gradually saw many businesses close or move away. Main Street was no longer a primary thoroughfare. A new road had taken its place, Interstate 81. I remember it being a bypass first because it used to do some drag racing on it. Uh, <laughs> But it just went from, from the south end of town to the north end of town, and it was just a way of getting, keeping trucks and a lot of traffic out of, out of the area. That was in, what, early 60s? Very early. Very early. 60, 61. 59, 60, 61, 62. When they built that. I do remember being at the uh, Cloverleaf Shopping Center when that was just about all there was out there. And, uh, and it was only la much later in life that I realized it was called the Cloverleaf Shopping Center because of the interstate, the Cloverleaf there at the interstate. Just across the interstate there was nothing uh, but fields and, uh, and Neff's trailer sales. And again, uh, I think he did this as a promotion, get people to come and look at his trailers. Uh, he would have uh, country music stars uh, performing and free hot dogs and banners hanging and balloons for kids. It was a very exciting thing to do. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, I remember Bobby Bear, who no one remembers anymore, but uh, singing out there. I think he was famous his, for singing uh, Drop Kick Me Jesus Through the Gold Posts of Life. <laughs> <laughs> And of course, by the time I was uh, a young teenager, Valley Mall had opened up and the two main department stores left downtown, J.C. Penney and uh, Leggett, um, which led everyone else to go out there too. And so I think the downtown merchants basically just started to uh, lose a lot of business because, you know, it was new and exciting and everyone wanted to go to Valley Mall and uh, many people did and if your business leaves then, you know, you tend to close down. And it, to drive down Main Street now is really a, a strange experience because there's so many holes where you know there should be buildings. Uh, I, I hope your program will be viewed by people who will see that there is value in conserving buildings even if they were built in 1940 or something people make the argument that oh it's not historic you know so uh, 
there's no value. Let's bulldoze it and that we'll make more room for parking or we'll put up a new building. And uh, obviously I work for a historical society and therefore I'm a historical minded person. But you know, it seems to me that part of, of the identity of a community is, is in its landscape. And once you start to fool with the landscape, you're fooling with the identity as well. Though many of Harrisonburg's businesses and buildings have long since disappeared, there are still some that have been saved or still have the potential for saving. The new marketplace on Court Square is helping to bring business and culture back to the downtown area. But many residents say that even if downtown becomes a bustling area again, it probably can never be as it was when they were kids, when everybody knew everybody and it felt like a family. A lot of folks recall very vividly names, if not uh, faces at least, of the clerks in the stores and other people that were running the community. Uh, not maybe so much politically, but uh, you know, we remember Mrs. So-and-so or Miss So-and-so that worked at J.C. Penney's or was the clerk in First National Bank. And, and then everybody kind of knew where people fit in. We all have a common bond in a small town, and even though it's grown bigger and almost a metropolis now, it's still small in our minds and we can still relate to it and carry it on. I miss the security that we had in, in, in the, the way we used to be able to play as children that I know children today can't do just because of, for safety reasons, I think. But I, one of the things I wanted to say relative to what you were saying, Dave, is, is George and I just the other, my husband and I just the other night were talking and saying, you know, we, are, we were up in around the area behind them all, and we said, you know, it just didn't even feel like home anymore. And when, when she asked about our group getting together, that's one of the times that I think it feels like home around here. What would I want people to remember about Harrisonburg? That it was a community where people treasured one another and treasured their past and had a vision to preserve and pass something on to the future. Um, and that, that we really cared about the community. And I would hope that it would still be a community. Of course it would be different. I mean, you know, it always is, and that's, that's the point. I think there's also security in understanding the past. Because if you understand that there has been radical change in the past all along, then you're not as threatened by radical change that occurs in your own generation. And you realize that people do uh, go with the flow, you know, mm -hmm. that, it, that you can go on with that. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess that's what I'd want them to remember, that there were, that we were made up of a community of people who really uh, cared about each other and about the land and about life in general and found joy in all of it along the way. When my kids were growing up, I used to, I would always say to them, we worked hard to raise you up and make home for you. Don't ever let me hear one of you say, I'm gonna leave home and never coming back anymore. And uh, they would look at me and laugh and I would say, because this is where you were born. This is your ancestry. This is where you grew up. This is where your friends and your neighbors were. And you should never forget your roots and where you came from. This is part of your history, and it always will be.
production of this program was sponsored in part by Suter's Handcrafted Furniture of Harrisonburg. Since 1839, Suter's has created elegant furniture your family will value for generations. Additional funding was provided by the law firm of Wharton, Aldheiser, and Weaver of Harrisonburg, providing a full range of legal services to its business and individual clients throughout the Shenandoah Valley since 1845.